Lucius is back! Back again, for the third time. He's not alone as McGruffin is with him, and they are about to return back in more than one way. Spoilers be aware as I review Lucius 3, the final game in this hellish trilogy. The camp is back! You know how happy I am about this? More happy than words can describe. So the first game was fun and campy, and very much like art, despite lacking heavily in gameplay. The D make tied it together in the gameplay department, kept some of the camp, but didn't live up to it like the original did. Lucius 2 got the gameplay right, but it was at the cost of the same amazing levels of camp as the first game had, by structuring the game in a level by level structure, and thus focusing in the story more on the journey Lucius and MacGuffin spent together, fulfilling the prophecy of Lucifer, and the coming of the rapture. With the third game, Shiver Games finally got it right on all ends. I will go through the game's opening, before we will delve deeper into the campy masterpiece of art. Game Intro The game starts right where the second game left off. MacGuffin drives himself and Lucius from Ludlow in the refugee bus, just traveling and traveling, while a cover of the song House of the Rising Sun, made by Flute of Shame, is playing. Eventually, a blonde man in a bright suit stands in the middle of the road and the bus is driven off the road and into a tree. MacGuffin wakes up and has a chat with the man smoking a cigarette. This is Gabriel, and if you know your Bible well, you figure out that it's none other than the Archangel Gabriel. If you do not know that, who that is, he gives you a vague hint about it anyway. He lets MacGuffin know that he was going to kill them both, but there are still some hope left for Lucius. As Lucius wakes up, Gabriel disappears and MacGuffin warns Lucius about a new key player that they have to look out for if they are to succeed. Thus, the prologue begins with both of them trying to get to the town, and for the first time, Lucius can jump! That's because you will have some platforming to do. You can now die in the game, and the game does keep track of your total deaths. Death has no consequences though, as the game loads back rather quickly. You die by falling from very high heights. Once you've made it down the cliffs, you enter a lawn from the back door, where there is a neighbor barbecue going on. McGuffin know these people, and as it turns out, they know of Lucius, and the reason is because of the Wagner incident. As it turns out, you are back in your hometown from the first game. You know, I have an idea. You know what you could do, Lucius? You could take this camera and be our cameraman for the party. You are given a camera, and it's now time to take snaps of all the people and get to know them better, as these are the people you will interact with throughout the game, and eventually murder. You eventually make it for the back, where you find a wounded raven the kids are abusing. They are a bunch of assholes. So Lucius blows up the bird and scares the little shit shitless, as well as keeping the heart, which is important. I personally love this way of showcasing that individual and unique kills are back from the first game. Lucius keeps the heart, and that is an important item. Afterwards, you make it for your new home, and after settling, you find McGuffing detective work while well, Lucius was at the psychiatric ward in the second game, and he talks about the new targets, and as it turns out, the victims will become the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So, the goal of the game is to figure out who will be one of the four horsemen, by learning the entire neighborhood, and the people in it, judged by their professions and behaviors. To keep you up with who the four horsemen of the apocalypse are, they are the following, conquest, war, famine, and death. They are the harbingers of the divine apocalypse set on the world as the last judgment. So let us move on to gameplay and the world of Lucius 3 as a whole. Gameplay. So this game is kind of open world and it has its similarities to Deadly Premonition. It does lack the timer but the world and all people do their things. All characters sure are characters, and one of the neighbors is a real creeper, and has that annoying kid calling you Death Kid. Pretty sure the father of the family is a kiddler fiddler, because he acts like a creep around Lucius, and sadly, I never got the chance to kill him, but more about that later. So what's new with this game is that you can still pick up key items like the first game, which are used in the murders. Some can only be found and used on certain days in the game. 
You also have various costumes you can change into, which are needed for certain events. Some murders can only occur on certain days, and need some things to set up in order to having other people killed. For example, to kill the doctor, you need a drunk to beat up his son, but you can kill his son after that happens without being able to set the barred wire, making the doctor crash, and if you kill the son, you can no longer trigger this event, so you need to plan all murders individually, and not kill too hastily, if you want to kill them all. With the raven hearts, you can transform into a raven and fly, thus fast traveling which is simply amazing. I love just flying around in the world, even if this is where the game is the laggiest. Also, do not transform yourself back into human while being too high up, as you will die and start back from the original flying point while spending that raven heart. So not only is the gameplay camp, but so is the story, as you try to find and murder the horsemen while setting them up on display behind yours and MacGuffin's house. Something I love about this game is how weird so many of the people are in this game. Take for example the guy living in the junkyard building stuff, who sounds like a complete nerd. Is that an SGX-72 LAN camera? Where, where did you get that? He always reminds me of Napoleon Dynamite, and I'm pretty sure that's who he's supposed to be a parody of. Don't worry about missing to kill any of the optional people, as you get a chance to kill them all near the end of the game anyway, but the more you kill before that, the easier that section becomes. Besides the four horsemen, I managed to kill all kids but one, as well as the guy living in the junkyard, and I absolutely love the fact that unique kills are back, and making them optional is a great way for replayability, as it makes the entire world into one big puzzle piece to solve as well. I won't go in depth about the chapters, nor el elaborate more about the story, but I will cover two endings of the game as well as heavy spoilers. But first, I will go through the music. Music. While I think the music was better in Lucius 2, it's still a lot better than it was in the first game. I'd say it's slightly better in Lucius 3 than it was in Lucius D make. Between Rock and a Fire is a really good track, for example. But all the music has one connected theme, and that is darkness, and that the Lord of Darkness, Lucifer, is close to coming back. I don't have much to say about the music in general, more than it's pretty good. Spoiler warning, the end game is near. So if you don't want this spoiled, skip to the time code on the screen, you have a few seconds to do so. The end game and your final choice. So, throughout the game, you met Gabriel, who resides in the town, and he has told you about changes you need to make in order to save your soul, and that Lucifer is not to be trusted. He has managed to affect MacGuffin's mind, and MacGuffin tells Lucius that he might have to think on his own before Lucifer kills MacGuffin. Filled with revenge, Lucius set out for the elevator leading to the underworld. First though, he has to find a dagger he killed his grandpa with in the first game, so he makes it for the basement of the burned down mansion to collect it. This dagger is the only thing that can hurt Lucifer, thus why it's important. So after taking the elevator down to hell, Lucius makes it for his revenge. Hell is a series of platforms you need to go through and the worst one is the final one where you have to jump onto platforms moving around in a tornado. This is where the quality of this game lowers quite a bit as these platforms are glitch a glitchy mess and even if some jumps shouldn't connect, they do, and if some jumps that should connect, which don't. In fact, I spent over an hour trying to get through this section. Anyhow, if you make it, you get to kill Lucifer, and now you are presented with a choice as Gabriel appears. Serves you right, cunt. You can walk onto the bridge leading to heaven to reunite with the good side of your family, meaning meet up with your mother or kill Gabriel with a dagger to get your rightful place as the ruler of hell. Conclusion. So is this game any good? And is it the rightful end of the Lucius series? I would say that it is the best Lucius game that exists to date and it's the definitive Lucius game to play. It tells you what to happen in the second game, and it flashbacks the important bits from the first game, so it can be played without having to play the other Lucius games first. 
It has the right amount of camp to make it into art like the first game, but if you're outside of the love of camp and wacky games, I don't think this is the game for you. The humor is on the darker side, which is an acquired taste and not for the faint of heart. So just like with the first game, I can only recommend this game to those who love B-movies and camp with a silly story about the rapture, heaven and hell. It's on par with cult classics like Deadly Premonition in my opinion, but again, I could only recommend it to previous Lucius fans as well as fans of camp. With that said, I hope you have a great day and happy holidays!